Sup everybody, this is Carrick with ACG and it's my continuing mission to bring you reviews for completed games that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. And today we're treading through the terrible trials and tribulations of Resident Evil 7 Biohazard as you step into the generic, generic man shoes of our protagonist, Ethan, an everyday man in his quest to find his missing fiance, Mia. Now, regardless of title, each Resident Evil has really had those moments where you're running away from enemies so fast, you just hope all your damn limbs are going to arrive at the same time. With the switch to first person and a PSVR mode, let's see if Capcom's added a little little bit of pants poop and presence to the series. As always, if you like the video, eh, maybe subscribe. So here's my review for Resident Evil 7 Biohazard. All Barnes are Rave Barnes, the world's scariest dreamcatcher, and bad guy McGillicuddy as the friggin' Kool-Aid Man. Graphics are up first. While not the first of the Resident Evil titles to be first person, 7 is the first of the main series of titles to get this change, and it has come with some incredible improvements. Graphically, the game runs almost completely steady at 60 FPS at 1080p. Usually, it does use what appears to be a dynamic resolution algorithm on the PS4 and Xbox One to lower that a bit to keep the frame rate high, and on 4K on the PS4, it does appear to be checkerboarded. But it doesn't really matter because even if you're neck deep in burning blob bad guys exploding to just superheat their innards like the world's fastest sentient marshmallow roast, or if you're deep Deep in the bowels of a not so deserted oil tanker, the game almost always looks absolutely incredible. When you think about it, where many titles try to push the effects, blinding you with unrealistic effects and a more fantasy feel, Resident Evil 7 goes for a far more subdued look, and the filtering and post processing here gives it a rustic look throughout. Now, HDR implementation is working here, and once again, we see a game where its dark environments are absolutely beautiful when rendered out to a more colorful, rich signal. It may not be the best implementation of HDR, but it's one of the more useful, and it actually gives you more information about the scenery and absolutely adds to the feeling of immersion. Now, of course, this brings us to the PSVR representation, and you guys know I haven't been too excited about the relative barren landscape of releases for it. Here we have a 100% playable and complete Resident Evil in VR, and I have to say, it is without a shadow of a doubt a true testament to how presence can be impactful in a game. VR also comes with a significant improvement to aiming as you aim where you look, and I found my gameplay improved by just using the VR system, something that cannot be said for other games. And especially when doing Madhouse difficulty, it helped me out in a couple of spots I probably would have died in playing normally. But as I was playing, what really astounded me is how Resident Evil 7 was supposed to be about less breadth and more depth, and to be a bit tighter in its locations, and the fact that this worked so wonderfully is an example of good ideas turned into excellent implementation. I mean, traveling from houses that literally scream go away with their very presence, to the ruins of old oil tankers, to subterranean caves, the game handles the changes perfectly, and each location has a very unique art look to it, whether it be the worn and weathered old home of the homicidal clampets you meet at first, or the rusted and yet still puzzlingly powered belly of a giant ship or moving into the strangely colorful and yet still absolutely shit terrifying caverns. Each location looks incredible and is handled with care. Also, there is a defined feeling of connection between player and game state. There's a tangible feeling of being there as you get too close to an enemy and when you fire off a round, what appears to be a mix of three week old fruit salad and your worst nightmares covers your gun and spackles all your vision. Depth of field and an excellent lighting engine round this out and gives you an almost found footage style to the game that just sort of sings. However, not everything is right in the world of Resident Evil. First, the game revels in poor texturing, and because you're in first person and opening, closing, pushing, pulling, leaping, lunging, climbing, and diving your way through the game world, you're up close to everything. And truth be told, upon closer inspection, the lack of detail here can be shocking. It's a boon to the development team that their architecture and level design are so good, because that definitely hides some of these issues. But open up the first and what is this series of doors that look like tomato sauce and cottage cheese took a bath and then someone decided to paint a door with it, and you're bound to be a little let down. Also, the main game enemy designs are just downright bland. They're not bad and not good. Worse, they just sort of are. Due to how the story's designed, this is like being handed the keys to all the horror writer's vaults, being told to use whatever you want, and you return with the artistic design of an apologetic shrug. I mean, probably the scariest thing is this giant bubbling mass of tar and guts, and make no mistake, it is at times scary, but as with normal bog-standard enemies, who are also almost uniformly boring to look at, it's their animation and attacks and overall lethality that makes them interesting. However, on the flip side, the human NPCs you meet along the way are frightening, to say the least. The first time this undying bastard busts through a wall like it's wax paper and starts chortling about bad manners, there's a good chance you're going to want to make sure you pack some huggies, because damn, especially when you're in VR. As a package, when it comes to the graphics, Resident Evil delivers in a lot of ways. It isn't perfect, but what it lacks in the occasional special effect or flashy moment, it masterfully replaces with subtle horror overlaid on the terror of its locations and the characters' situations. The entire world is infected with an almost tangible unease, and if you're playing in VR, it is a sense of presence that is absolutely top-notch. Sound, music, and voice.
We need to go now! Where are you taking me? Someplace safe. Are you gonna tell me what's going on? Baby, you've been gone for three years. And, as usual, sound will go up first. You know, this is hit and miss. While some of the handguns have the punch of a three-year-old wailing away on one of those inflatable boxing bags that never falls down, and yes, that even includes the 44 and 45 caliber, you also have the flamethrower with its layered pop as the chemical ignites and its sole goal of turning enemies into the world's largest candles. And you can actually hear a great deal of variety there. On your machine gun, for example, which takes a while to get, but once you start firing it, there's this feeling of confidence that it exudes. But then you might notice its slightly leveled samples means it's not as kinetic as it actually should be, especially with some of these effects. If there's a gun that at least has some punch, it's the shotgun. Basically, this is a pump action canoe factory, boring huge holes into enemies' noggins with each knee-jerk reaction as you rush to fire, reload, and fire again before becoming some creature's next digestive moment. I really liked some of this, but there were a lot of problems as well. Now, one place where the game really lets you down is the environmental audio department, not in the samples themselves, which are amazing with wind whipping through broken halls of container ships or the echo of gunfire on walls, but instead just the separation and sound staging, which is abnormally generous. And this can result in times where sounds and samples played all around me versus from their original direction of origination. This was tested on all systems with various headphones and home theaters. Now, that being said, headphones and PSVR is still going to cause the occasional 13 year old schoolgirl scream as you panic like a a damn ninny when a creature sneaks up on you. It's altogether okay, but is lacking some finesse there in its soundstage. Music. So I enjoyed this, but it is very lean. The developers have certainly gone with a notice, but not always noteworthy track list and sound cues. Now, new locations, uh, post save game moments and the like all have their own tracks as do named enemies. There's a good deal of time, though, where the soundtrack is absolutely silent or a mix of ambient layering that's almost sub audible. But when enemies attack or when one is near, the sound cues begin to play out like a creepy discordant vibe. And then that mixes in with just a little bit of percussion to get the blood flowing. There isn't really much new here with a lot of horror styled synths buried inside repeating sound cues. I do have to absolutely applaud their use of bell-like and glassy harmonics on some of the samples, though. It absolutely mires you in this feeling of desolation and ghostliness, and it works wonders to build the atmosphere. Voice. I sincerely cannot believe I'm saying this, but I found it excellent. It's rare that I find a game where I am, for the most part, happy with the voice work, and especially a Resident Evil title, but gone for the most part are any of the bored dude reading lines while friends are being cut up next to him deliveries. Even Mio, when trying to recreate the music video take on me from AHA, does absolutely excellent work with a mixture of fear and outright almost bestial anger. And the first time you see this house in the middle of nowhere and decide to skip up to it like you want some fucking snickerdoodles and meet the resident inside, it's actually really good voice work. There is one sour note, though. For reasons unknown, one character who's supposed to have a fairly heavy accent totally loses it on various occasions, which, when compared to the rest of the delivery, is actually shockingly noticeable. It's like Sean Connery randomly sounding like Patrick Stewart or something odd like that. Luckily, it only happens a handful of times, but it was completely noticeable. As a package, pretty goddamn good voice work. And that brings us to gameplay and a bit about the story. So you play as Ethan, who for the last three years has thought his fiance was dead or missing. You get a VCR tape with her leaving a message to stay away. That's right, folks. It's basically the world's scariest ex calling you after being out of your life for years just to mention they don't want to hook up. But Ethan, as we would expect, is just a normal everyday guy. So he jumps in his car, heads to Louisiana to find out why Mia just sent him the weirdest Dear John letter ever. And thus begins the descent into madness. Fairly quickly, you're thrust into a story that finds you trying to save Mia who tries to save you while trying to save her. It sounds like a typical Resident Evil story, and it pretty much is. And for the most part, it is the kind of story we would expect, but it's told in a far more condensed and personally, to me at least, better way than past Resident Evil games. And while there is some head-scratching moments, overall, I liked the story, and there's even one or two huge decision moments that I enjoyed playing through again to see what happened if I made a different choice. Now, as you're playing, you need to investigate the locations, keep yourself safe, occasionally fight off enemies, sometimes hide from them, and some other times maybe try to trick them. The game has some of the same gameplay elements of prior Resident Evil titles, like storage that's always teleporting items everywhere and the consistent inventory juggling that you would all pretty much expect. But I have to say, the switch to first person just finally nailed Resident Evil for me personally. Now, I've loved some Resident Evil games. Code Veronica is probably one of my favorites, but many times I felt that I could never fully interact 
interact with them, probably in no small part to their control schemes, which seem to be nothing more than variants on a, a SWAT bomb disposal robot and how it would control. Here, there's a slickness to Ethan, and while he usually isn't just fleet of foot, the movement, and especially the gunplay, is spot on. I mean, it's not going to eclipse top-tier shooters, but it is still much better than I expected. Also, when you're playing, many items can be upgraded or repaired, and new ones are found all around the house, and depending on the difficulty, they appear in unique places or after puzzles or in unique numbers. Now, as you guys know, I like to test out the AI in games from easy for newcomers to the horror franchises all the way to hard, and in this case, madhouse difficulty, which is only unlocked once you beat the game. Easy is something along the lines of taking your kids to an amusement ride and just having them press buttons to get the friggin' roller coaster to start. And to be honest, that's okay. Normal is somewhat more difficult with enemies dropping after a couple more shots to their mishap and domes, but Madhouse is exactly as it sounds. Items are in different places, enemies move at different speeds, and everything is like you would expect in a horror movie. Able to withstand absolutely apocalyptic levels of damage. You don't have to be in VR to have an oh shit moment when you point blank fire a flamethrower in an enemy's face and his reaction is to walk into the flame like it's thanking you for a hot blanket. That's the one issue I actually have with Resident Evil 7. It feels like it's missing a hard difficulty. Normal's fine, but it doesn't offer much of a challenge. While Madhouse basically kicks you in the nuts, then offers to pick you up, puts a hand out, then kicks you in the nuts again, changing and lowering checkpoint numbers and all manner of other options. I like that. I do like insane, crunchy difficulty, but I don't see any reason that a middle ground couldn't have been available for some gamers. Location-specific damage is very important in those higher difficulties, so be aware of that. Shooting a creature in the legs might slow it down or topple it over, offering you a moment to reload or pour some god juice on your arm to heal yourself up. Additionally, the game really changes up some things later on, and halfway through the game, with upgrades, new situations, new different items, familiar places will play out quite a bit differently. Now, every Resident Evil's had some puzzles here and there, and this game is surprisingly light in required puzzles, which I actually liked. It was one of those things that you could engage in a couple if you wanted, but you did not have to. What I liked about this is it really left it open for me to decide how I was going to integrate that push-pull mechanic that's always been so prevalent within the Resident Evil titles of items, their use, and how hurt you are, versus the puzzles that might be there and might get you something extra or something special if you end up solving them. Is the game perfect? No. First of all, the Resident Evil door and key gameplay mechanic plays out a bit oddly in first person, and about halfway through this game I started to feel like I was playing a Mist, the creepiest shit edition. And the game, just like many titles of this kind, still rests on its narrative laurels, allowing for absolutely batshit crazy circumstances and chance moments to change entire plots. I mean, we've seen it before. These games have you traipsing halfway across a level because the dude with the key decided the best thing to do would be to sprint to the other side of the game world and die behind a locker, so you have to trek to find him. It's a typical gameplay conceit, but Resident Evil's excellence elsewhere actually made this even more noticeable when it occurred. And the story, while much better, still has some kinks that never really get worked out. And to that, there's effectively a fairly mundane and almost misplaced battle at the end and a bit of a sort of shine that wore off as I passed the finish line, especially the second time. It feels like somehow George Lucas came in and said, oh, wait, let's have a dance party at the end versus, you know, just actually finishing the movie. Here's the thing. The game can probably be beaten on normal in about 10 to 12 hours, and that is probably one of the most enjoyable 10 to 12 hour stretches in recent memory, and most certainly if you just compare it to Resident Evil games. The switch to first person, the tighter hold on story, and the well thought out and more connected locations and architecture absolutely works to offer a cohesive experience that really harkens back to some of the more classic Resident Evil titles. It really just has some excellent gameplay. Fun Factor. Yeah, I enjoyed the title. Absolutely had a great time. I can't stress how stripping it back down to fewer, more narratively connected places has elevated the presentation here. The pacing is also spectacular, and so is the slow doling out of locations like figuring out the pieces to a jigsaw puzzle as the story and unique areas unfold in front of you. And as I said, PSVR nails the feeling of presence. The ability to play the entire game within it is incredible and cannot be denied. So as you guys know, I rate games on a buy, wait for sale, rent, or never touched again rating scale. This is absolutely a buy, even if it's on the Xbox One or the PC without VR. The game is really enjoyable. Is it a classic? Probably not. Is it an incredible entry into the series without a shadow of a doubt? So anyway, that's it for me. I hope you guys liked the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down. Maybe check out Twitter or Patreon. That is absolutely how I continue to give you guys reviews that aren't, well, two minutes long and filled with sponsored bullcrap. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week. Sorry, buddy.